We'll probably give people um, a few minutes to make sure they are able to log in. Uh, I think we had about 36 uh, RSVPs, although, um, you know, homework might have scared them. I don't know. I don't know. But it was good homework. Um, by the way, I wanted to share that uh, that the full book that that uh, reading came from is available uh, open source online and um, the link is in the, the chat. We won't get to get into really discussing too much of uh, contract grading today, but um, it's a really good book. You said it's in the chat, Harry? Yes, can you see it? No. Oh, let me try that again. Thank you, because I do want to read chapter four, so that'd be great. Okay, try that now. You you do this a whole bunch of practice and then something weird happens and it's like, why did it do that? There now. It should be there now. Harry, um, Professor Obuck, Dolores Obuck is trying to get in the call. Is there any way to send out the link again to her specifically? I don't want to hold you up, but. Yes, I can do that. So De yeah, Dolores Obuck, O-B-U-C-H. I'll tell her that you're going to do that. She just texted me. Carrie is going to send you the link right now, period, via email, period. Sorry, I meant to be on mute. I just unmuted myself. I put this in the chat, but I'm my audio was off, so I don't know what we're doing. What are we doing? We're just waiting a minute to start. Oh, okay, to it, everybody was like looking so intensely and there was this link <laughs> and I was like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> okay, cool. cool. Hi, everyone. Everyone. Carrie nice put a link to, to the book that the reading came from. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got my, right. I got my reading here. So excellent. But as long as I'm not missing something, okay. Thank you, and Lisa. Hey, Carolyn. I just want to say hi to people. It's so nice to see people. Hi, Connie. Exactly. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hi, Tisha. How are you? <laughs> hey, Elise. Nice to see you too. Oh, you look to summary. I miss everyone. It's been so long. I know it's good to see faces. Oh wow, yeah. really it is. <laughs> Carrie, you want to get started? Okay, so I just yeah, wanted sure. to thank everybody for joining us today, and most especially to thank um, Dr. Carrie Monzo, visiting professor of literature, for this second faculty development workshop on remote teaching. Um, this is not what you usually teach, right? You teach all kinds of literature, global literature. Um, really fascinating classes that I mentioned last time. 
Um, and the fact that you're willing to make yourself available to work through this with us as one of us, right, who's, who's really had to make use of this in your own classes um, is really extraordinary. So thank you so much for your efforts. Um, last week, you did a great job put, sort of walking us step by step through how to use VoiceThread. And today, I know you're going to be talking about using shared inquiry in remote teaching on Zoom. So please, Dr. Monzo. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, and uh, uh, this week is going to be um, more interactive. In fact, we're going to start very interactive. Um, so I think it'll be uh, exciting. Um, I want to, I'm going to put a link in the chat to a Google Drive. And I'm going to refer to that, to the documents in that Google Drive at different points. Uh, when you open that link, you, you may have to sign in to access the files, but when you open that link, um, the first thing you should see is a copy of the reading, a PDF of the reading that's available in case you don't have that accessible. You can um, download that right now. And then you'll also see uh, the PowerPoint of the presentation and then some other documents. One of the things you might notice is that um, the, each of the file names of those documents is preceded with a number. Um, one, two, two point one, so forth, and that's to keep them in order of when I I think about when we'll be using them and referring to them, um, uh, because Google Drive uh, sorts things either numerically or alphabetically as you get started or as you uh, upload them. So, um, so we're going to start today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and and share my screen. And um, Keith, can I ask you um, if you, anybody chimes into the call, um, are, are you able to uh, let them in? Yeah, I can, I can let people in. I just have to keep an eye on the participants window. Okay, great, thanks. All right, um, so let's uh, do my... All right, can we all see my PowerPoint? Okay, great. So um, today we're going to be talking about using uh, shared inquiry and in remote teaching via Zoom. Shared inquiry is a Socratic discussion method that I generally use in a face-to-face -face class, um, but uh, um, I found almost by accident that it worked very well in a virtual format in Zoom just as long as certain uh, parameters were set and uh, their technology was being used in a particular way. So, um, so a lot of, this is sort of a low tech, high tech, you're gonna notice a mix of the two throughout this uh, presentation. Um, and it's really geared towards looking at the tool that we have and that we're really relying a lot on and seeing how I can best make it work for something that's already works really well in my classrooms, um, rather than trying to adjust everything that I do in a classroom to fit um, uh, technology. I wanna, I wanna use the technology as a tool. So to start out today, um, you are actually going to be playing the role of undergraduate students um, as we do a demonstration of shared inquiry. Um, so I'm going to, as we go through the demonstration, I'm going to uh, give you instructions just the way I would to my students uh, in, in the classroom. And I'm going to assume that this is our first day doing this. So generally on the first day we do a shared inquiry. I have to give a lot of instruction. By the end of the semester, they're just like, okay, we know, let's, let's go on. We, we, we know how to do this. Um, so there'll be a lot of instruction uh, with, with how to engage in the sh shared inquiry and what the goals are. So um, let's uh, first just start by talking about um, what is shared inquiry. So, um, and I, this is how I start with my students. So shared inquiry is a Socratic discussion method, which means it's a method of discussion that's based, uh, that's based on posing a question. It's a very broad question, one that um, a, a lot of people can have different perspectives on, and it's, um, it's a very open-ended question. Um, 
there are certain guidelines and rules and ways we engage in shared inquiry to facilitate it and to make sure that our discussion and conversation goes as smoothly as possible. Um, so let's talk about um, first what the goals and outcomes are. Um, so why, why shared inquiry? What do I want us to get out of it? Well, first of all, I want you to think about your thinking. Um, I want you to think about where your thinking comes from and how it relates to uh, the thinking of your peers. And to that end, I want you to practice the skill of listening to others. Uh, sometimes it feels like we, we don't do a whole lot of this today, um, and it's something, a skill that we could all really work on. So listening to others is a foundation of what shared inquiry is about. Um, as part of that, give, practicing giving respect to others' ideas, even when you disagree with those ideas, right? We can still respect those, we can still be respectful with those ideas and how they are presented if they merit respect. So, um, so we want to practice that giving respect to other people's ideas. I also want you to practice asking for clarification or missing information um, when it happens. Again, this is a skill I don't think that, um, I think that many people don't use enough. So um, when do we need to stop and say, hey, could you tell me what you mean by that? Could you clarify? Could you give me a little more information? Or I don't see how um, A connects to C. Could you help me out with that? That's an important skill. And it also is opens a space where your peers can practice giving that miss, missing information, providing the clarification and connecting points that may have been disconnected. Um, and lastly, and this is a huge, is uh, I want you to practice supporting your ideas with evidence. This is fundamental to uh, many forms of argumentation, whether spoken or written, um, and even just conversation is, is making sure that you can identify the ideas, the evidence that supports your ideas, and then convey those in a way that others can respond to. So we're looking to do all of those things through shared inquiry. So I have some guidelines that we have to follow with shared inquiry. And these guidelines are really um, to help um, the, the conversation be productive. First, um, I want us to limit our discussion to the text that the class read. Uh, sometimes it's tempting in these conversations to talk about you, a book you read in another class or a movie you saw last weekend or to bring in something that is outside of the context of what our peers are all bringing to the discussion. So we want to stick with something that we can all grasp on. Um, if we go on tangents about other things, then chances are we leave somebody off who can't relate to that. So we want to stick with the text that the class is familiar with or the, text the class is reading. And that's where we want to look to for evidence to support our ideas. Um, I want you to address the facil the facil I'm the facilitator in this. So I want you to address the question I pose. I'm going to pose a broad, big, broad question for you to work with. Well, not broad. It's specific, but it's a big question. So um, I'm, I'm going to pose that question, and I want you to address your answers to that question. Try and stick with it. There's a lot of room to, to go with the question, but stay with the question or the discussion as it develops from the question. So sometimes the question opens up other venues that are still related and need to be explored. So make sure you stay with the question and stay with the conversation. If as the facilitator, I feel like we've gone too far into left field, I'll bring us back, right? Um, but so we wanna, we wanna try and we wanna stick with the question. Um, I want you to speak up when you're ready to speak up and share your ideas. Um, everybody should have a chance to speak. For some of us um, who have a lot of ideas, that might mean um, holding back and, and leaving space for others to speak up as well. Um, but make sure that when you have ideas, you speak up, you share those, and you ask others for clarification when needed. Now, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a little work in preparing us for the discussion that'll help you develop those ideas so you don't have to panic about well, will I have an idea? Will I have something to share? You will. Um, when you need clarification again uh, of facts, especially um, 
So let's say a word comes up in the discussion and it's a word that you're not familiar with. Like somebody keeps talking about ideology and you, you've never heard that word. Or you think you know what it means, but you're not quite sure. You can say, hang on, could we get a definition for that? Um, and if, if the person using the term is struggling, I can help with that. So if we need clarification of, of things like that, I'm, I'm totally here to help. Otherwise, I'm gonna be out of the discussion. I'm gonna be um, doing something a little else, which I'll explain in just a moment. Um, another guideline, disagree respectfully if you need to. So, I mean, it's a saying I respectfully disagree I'm seeing this other perspective, or I see your point, but I, I see it this way, right? So, so disagree when you need to, but disagree respectfully. Um, listen carefully. Now, we're a large group today, and so we're gonna do something called inside-outside circles, which means that half of the group is gonna be talking and half of the group is gonna be listening, and then we're gonna switch. So if you're in the listening group, you want to listen very carefully because when you come, when when we switch, you'll be having a chance to speak. And the same with if you start speaking, then when you're in the listening group, you really want to listen. So we're listening whether um, we're inside or outside. Um, and lastly, revisit the text when we need to. It's okay to say, but wait, if we look on page and this paragraph, give us a moment so everybody can get to it. Um, we see this, right? So revisit the text um, when you need to and draw our attention to it, okay? Um, so those are our guidelines. Do we have any questions before we get started with that? Oops. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, so we have a question and we have a text. Before we get to the question, let's revisit the text, right? Okay, so what I want you to do is to open up your copy of the text that is the introduction to Inouye's book, um, uh, Contract Grading. It's a PDF. If you have lost or misplaced it, there's a copy of it in the Google Drive, so you can download that. Um, for the purposes of discussion, to make this easier, I suggest that um, if you are, uh, so I suggest that the device, if you're using to access your text, if you're using a device for your text, is separate from the, the device you're using to Zoom. Right? So um, some of you may have a print copy of the text and that's great, but if you're doing electronic text or a, a digital copy, you wanna have a, that on a separate device if possible. The reason is, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment here. The reason I want us to do that is that as we're discussing, you know, if we were face to face, we'd be in a big circle or two circles and we'd see each other's faces and we'd be able to take cues from that. But we're, we can't do that, and so we're doing this virtually. So what I want you to be able to do is to have Zoom open on the biggest screen you have so you can see as many faces as possible, and I want you to be in gallery view, right? So it should look like um, Hollywood Squares or the Brady Bunch in front of you. Um, and, uh, and, and so you'll have that view open so you can see one another, and then your device, if you have your, your text on a device, it'll be you know, a, separate, a separate device that you can work with. Okay, so go ahead and open up that text and I want you to turn to page 13 on the text. It's um, the 13, you'll see that the section Assessment, Ecologies, and Me begins. Um, and then I want us to, look down to the last paragraph on that page. It's the paragraph that breaks over into uh, the next page and it starts with, I should note an initial paradox. 
Sorry, I was trying to get my phone to work. What page are you using? Sorry. No problem. Page 13. And if for our purposes today, you just have one device, that's okay. But um, for, um, for my students, I'm going to, in the syllabus, say that the text and the device for access should be separate um, so that they can manage the two. If they're trying to flip back and forth in Windows on one device, I think that'll get um, confusing. And for us, it'll be hard to see if we have everyone's attention. Yeah, Samuel? Uh, yeah, is that... Uh PDF page 13 or 13 in the text? PDF page, it should be, whoops, should be page 13 in the text. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And also, before I jump back into our, our play role, um, students may have different devices. They might have, or might have different editions. They might have print, right, which is, you know, one. They might have a PDF of the print which it means that it'll be stable and it'll have the same page numbers generally as the print, generally, right? Um, and then they might have an ebook that does not have stable pagination, right? So if they have an ebook, the page numbers, the page numbers, the location numbers, doesn't have pages in some of those, is going to be different from device to device. If you have that, if you have some students who have an ebook, then the instructions you want to give them at this point is search for the phrase and then give them the, the, the leading phrase in that paragraph and they'll search and it'll come right to them, right? So, so you wanna be aware of the different um, texts that students can use if you're allowing all kinds of texts. Okay, so um, back to play role you're back to being students, undergraduate students. Okay, so before I give us our question to answer, it's helpful to revisit the text and to revisit the text with some things in mind. Um, so what I'm going to do, my text is right over here, I'm going to read this section of the text and I'm going to have you listen along. And while you're listening, um, what I want you to look for, I want you to look for certain things as you're listening along. I want you to look for places in the text that evoke ideas about language and literacy. These can be like literal statements about language and literacy, or it could be just sort of allusions, or it could just be that you, you sense that this is something about language or literacy, but it doesn't say that specifically, right? So you're just looking for um, any of these things, any of these evocation, evocations of language and or literacy. So when you see something like that, you're going to mark on your text. You don't have to write anything big or just um, all you can, you might just put LI or LA. If you're using a digital copy, you can just quickly drop a little comment right there so you know to come back to it. Um, some PDFs, you can use the highlight feature, right, and just highlight real quickly and some will allow text. And if you're using um, like an iPad, you might be able to use like a stylus to write on your screen. So you can use any of these things. The main important thing is that you're dropping a little, a little visual cue there that you saw something. Um, and then, so I'll just read through and then we'll come back and look at the question and, and use these things. All right, so follow along. I should note an initial paradox that is not lost on me, and it has the significant bearing on my labor-based grading contract ecologies. I realize the oxymoronic haunting whiteness, as Kennedy, Middleton, and Ratcliffe would say, in my own discourse in this book. This is part of the problematic of writing assessment that led me to grading contracts, which I discuss in chapters one and two. My own brand of code-meshed English, like everyone's, is a product of my history in schools and growing up in poor and working class areas, all culturally, linguistically, and racially mixed. I left those discourses behind, or so I thought. The discourse from the academy, the white middle-class discourse I worked so hard to take on, seemed to give me access and opportunities that I likely wouldn't have had otherwise. But if I'm really honest, 
My own striving for the dominant English I currently practice started with an impulse not to be poor, not to be seen as stupid, not to be brown, not to be in the outer dikes of the US. I thought I wanted to be white, and this was the lesson that all of my writing assessment ecologies taught me in school. You see, I was raised on Stats Street in North Las Vegas, the very bad part of town, the black part, a city created by banks redlining practices. Everyone in my neighborhood, except for one college-aged neighbor, my brother and me, were black. We lived in roach-infested, government-subsidized housing. By the later years of elementary school, we'd moved to a white, working-class neighborhood on the edge of several Latinx communities in the southeast part of Vegas. We moved from an outer to an inner dike, all the while following the carrot of economic success and the promise of upward mobility, an upward mobility that was easier for us than our black neighbors on stats. To my knowledge, we were the only ones from stats that left. It wasn't easy. We were never accepted in the new community. Inner dikes are socially engineered to whiten themselves automatically. Our new white working class neighbors in Paco's trailer park explicitly told us on many occasions, often whenever they had the chance, that they didn't like people like us living there. They didn't want us brown folks in the trailer park. They used worse language. But I was determined in all the senses that that word can mean to stay just long enough to leave, to move in the system of dikes. What was required was school, learning, literacy, the dominant English. That, this meant good grades. I didn't understand how docile this made me in school. I didn't understand the internal colonization. I didn't understand how grading by a single standard in all those classes of my youth were sending me one message, be white or be gone. I loved getting good grades in school, I won't lie, but I hated how I had to get them. It was like lying every day until the lies became me, until I couldn't tell anymore what was a lie and what was me. What I've while I've gained much from my education, I've also given up or forgotten much of my working class, ghetto, African-American English that I began my schooling with. The aspects of my own habitus that I accentuate in my classrooms and scholarly work are now ones of growing up half Japanese and working poor, not working class, and of having a mom who would say she is white, but I'm not convinced she fully believes it. We have Greek, English, and Scottish ancestors on her side. My mom is not fair-skinned nor fair-haired but fair enough to pass as or to be white in the US today. I never was. She never got a college degree, was single most of my childhood and worked three jobs so that we could be working poor. She would say to me, get good grades, do the extra credit. No one asks you how you got your A. A B student is an A student who didn't apply himself. She was telling me to labor, to work. My mom is smart, detail-oriented, and beautiful in her work ethic. She led by example. She labored every day to exhaustion without complaint, often collapsing on the couch late at night. I love my mom, and she always showed her love to me. But she was also stern about grades and school, sometimes to the point of unfairness. I know it was because she didn't want me to do what she had to do, to work and work and work and still never have enough money or clothes or food or time with your family. The lesson I took from my mom was a simple motto that I carried with me into college and my career. I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but I damn well will be the hardest working one. In college, I made sure I did more work than anyone else. I leaned heavily on the doing of things. I tried hard to savor the work, focused on enjoying the labor, since I couldn't always depend on how others would judge the products of my labors. What I realize now is that I slowly over the years turned this motto into a pedagogy, then an assessment practice, 
which would become a la labor-based grading, labor grading contracts. What I also realize now is that I got the first part of my motto wrong. To be judged the smartest guy in the room means there's a single standard to judge what smart means. That standard has always been a white racial habitus, a white discourse. So of course, by definition, I literally can never be the smartest guy in the room. I cannot be the white guy speaking well, to alter Quintilian's definition of an orator. Then there was a point in my adult life when I stopped trying to deny the language of my upbringing, the language of the streets of North Las Vegas, and I moved to retain enough of that old discourse to use as a critical optic or phonic apparatus, as a way to look and listen for the whiteness around me and in me. I stopped resisting my body's need to move when talking. My body must move with my words, even when writing. As I'm typing and reading this now, I am moving my body to feel the sentences, to feel what I need to say. I've been told I'm quite expressive and passionate when I speak or teach or just shoot the shit with others. This ability to deny a black discourse and adopt a white discourse is a white privilege I know I have, one I must acknowledge and problematize continually. One I resist, yet I know, yet know that I am allowed to take advantage of professionally. I ain't proud of leaving the, leaving the language of my nurture behind or trying to leave it behind, a paradox in the problematic especially when I meet students today who language the way I did back then, when my own feedback to their languaging pressures them toward a white racial habitus. Then again, I ain't all white middle class, I ain't all white middle class habitus. I often draw on this in my languaging with students. Another paradox, I claim my Japanese heritage, my dad's family, despite growing up not knowing him at all. Another paradox. My mom is Scottish, English, and some Greek. Imagine that, a Japanese American, usually mistaken for Latino, who started in life speaking African American English, living in African American communities, and yet speaking mostly standard white middle class English now, and raised by a poor working mom who sees herself as white. Paradoxes. Like everyone, I code mesh. This thing you read now is code meshed. My work with labor-based grading contracts is in part a coming to terms with my own intersectional, racialized educational and linguistic history through my students and their languaging. Knowing these things about me may help you understand just how many grains of salt you should take with what I offer. It should also suggest the ways I honor labor and how deeply I have felt its importance in my life, classroom, and scholarship. Okay, that was quite a bit, but I'm going to pause right there, and then I'm going and I'm going to bring us to our question. Okay, so you're going to see that the question isn't just a question. Um, there's a question and then there's some, um, some writing and some blank spaces. Um, it looks sort of like if you ever did Mad Libs in school where you had to fill in like, um, you know, you paired up with a friend and you ask them for a noun and fill that. It sort of looks like that. Okay, it's called, this is called a writing template and I'll talk more about it in just a moment. But let's look at our question. So, we just read that portion earlier in the introduction, before this portion that we just read, Inoue argues that literacy as white property serves to fortify white supremacy. That was in the, the assigned. And then in this section that we just read, the author implicitly juxtaposes, I think, you can argue with me if you disagree. Well, you can argue with your peers if you disagree. Um, but implicitly juxtaposes literacy and what he calls languaging. Okay, so here's my question. Um, what do you think the author means by languaging? How is languaging different from literacy? 
and how might attention to languaging provide ways out of the problems of literacy? So this is a three-part question, and beneath this you see my template. So what the template does is it's going to guide you, help you get started with your writing a little bit. Um, one of the things it does is it, it takes the pressure off you of like, how do I get started? Um, and just gets rid of that, gets you started, and, and launches you into your answer. So, so you can do the, the, the work of really thinking through your answer without having to think about, how do I start this sentence? So you're going to use the template to format your answer. And when you write your answer, I'm gonna ask you just to go low tech with this. I just want you on a sheet of, nice clean sheet of paper um, with a pen or pencil, um, if, you, if you have to type it today, that's fine. Um, but uh, I just want you to handwrite your answer on that sheet of paper uh, beside you uh, using the template. Okay, so I'm gonna, going to give you a few minutes and I'm, I'll post this question also in the chat. So if we need to come back to it later, we can. Come on. Um, uh, oh, there we go. My shortcut key is not working. Bah. Okay, there we are. Okay. Okay, so I posted the question in the chat. All right, I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'm gonna mute my mic while you answer. Um, students, I'm gonna ask that you keep your cameras on while you respond. Um, you don't have to look at the screen while you're doing it, but I just wanna make sure um, everybody's there. Um, and I'm also going to be keeping an eye on your faces so I can kind of guess when we're about done with writing our responses. Um, so once it sort of looks like most of you are ready, at that point, I'm going to say, okay, you have about two minutes and finish up, go ahead and finish up that thought. Okay, so go ahead and write your response to uh, the question and um, I'll keep an eye on everyone.
And so I'm seeing some faces that look like they're about finished. So I'm about, we'll give you about two more minutes. If, if that doesn't seem enough, let me know. We can give you more, but we'll do about two more minutes. Okay, and finish up that last thought as you're writing it out. Don't leave that sentence unfinished. Okay, um, and don't, I, I didn't say this at, at the beginning, but don't panic about things like misspelled words or if you're not sure about uh, a name or something, do the best you can right now. Consider um, this, you know, you're, you're, you're drafting your ideas, right? So, uh, so don't let those kinds of worries hold you back in formulating your response. Okay, so we're going to be getting the discussion in just a moment, but because um, we are a fairly large group, um, and by fairly large, I'm, I'm gonna say for the purposes of this kind of discussion, if you're over 22 students, um, you might want to um, uh, consider breaking into inside outside circles. So if we were physically in a room, what I'd do is have one small circle on the inside and a larger circle surrounding, thus the name inside outside circles. Since we can't do that, we're going to just imagine our inside outside circles. Um, and what our inside circle will be is all of you whose first name begins with a, a letters A through L. So if your first name begins with letters A through L, that's going to be my inside circle group, and you're going to be our, our starting discussant group. Next time we meet, we can switch. You're going to start us out today. And then those of you whose names start M through Z, you're going to be our outside circle group. Now, remember, so the, when we get started, the inside circle group is going to be the group that's, le that's discussing at first. The outside circle will just be listening. And outside circle, if you have questions about something that's said, go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll try to address them. Um, but otherwise, we're not going to use the chat for discussion at all. So we're going to keep our, our, our discussion um, in the vocal mode. Um, then at, at a point when I feel it's good, I'll, say, I'll pause us, we'll switch, and our outside circle will come inside and you'll pick up the conversation and we'll go from there. So we need to be paying attention as we go. And then when we finish, both inside and outside, um, we'll have one more uh, little writing assignment to close out our discussion. Make sense? Okay, so what I'm going to do and what I want you to do if you haven't done already, I'm going to stop sharing and I want us all to switch to a gallery view. So you should be seeing um, a, the gallery of, of, of uh, 
your peers. Now, those of you who are on the inside circle, group one, letters A through, a through L, um, I want you to unmute your microphone. And those of you who are in the, uh, so, so inside is, is going to unmute and those of you who are on the um, outside will mute. Now what that should do, when, we, when you look over in the participant window, that means that all of you who are on the inside circle should be at the top of the list of participants now. And those of you who are muted will be at the bottom of the list of participants. So we can kind of see the inside. Elise is shaking her head and saying it's not working. No, I would love if this worked. When you're saying that those people who are unmuted should rise to the top of gallery view? No. Oh. No, uh, in, the the part in the participants window. If you can't see the participants window and you're using a PC, use the shortcut Alt U. Oh. Alt U. Alt U. Okay, thank you. Yeah, now I will say that unfortunately there's no way to sort your um, tiles around in gallery view. Yeah. yeah it can't shame. happen. Um, uh, but Zoom is working on developing a, an option that will allow that. But as of now, um, it doesn't work. But uh, after we, we do the discussion, I'll talk about some, some things that uh, can work around. Yeah, Samuel, did you have a question? Uh, just a point of, I, I believe people who have their videos on are prioritized in the gallery view. And there is a setting where you can only display people who have their cameras on so that that's one way to front load people who have cameras on to the gallery view. That, to cram, sorry, yeah. Yeah, and um, there's some settings. I'll show you how to get to those settings um, in, in just a bit. Um, and if you decide to do that, there's a question that you have to navigate with your students. Do you want to allow cameras off? And so, yeah. Um, but yes, there's um, some of those features work. Okay. Um, all right, so back, back to our discussion. Um, where was I? Okay, so we have our question. Um, which is about this literacy and languaging, and we want to talk about what, what do we mean by languaging, or what does he mean by languaging, how is languaging different from literacy, and how might attention to languaging provide ways out of the problems of literacy. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask um, my inside circle to start, um, and anybody can jump in and start. This is the way I would do it if we were face to face. Um, and we'll just have to pay attention to one another to develop some norms around video conference thing that allow us to navigate this, this medium. So while you're in gallery view, you should be able to see almost all of your peers' faces. Um, in our regularly sized classrooms, you'll be able to get everybody into one window. I'll show you how to do that. Um, uh, so you want to keep an eye on on your peers faces and see if somebody looks like they're trying to jump in you know maybe make some space for them um, if you're trying to jump in to the discussion you want to contribute but you're having trouble finding a spot you can use the raise hand feature in zoom which if you want to just use the shortcut is alt y in pc and it's um I think it's option Y in Mac. I don't use a Mac. So uh, you can just use the raise hand feature um, if you want to jump in, but you're not finding a space. But otherwise, I want us to try and develop some kind of conversational norms. It's a little awkward, but we'll make it work. Um, I am not going to engage in the discussion. This is all about you. You guys get to have the discussion. I'm actually going to be looking at my other screen right here. So it might look like I'm not paying attention, but I'm totally paying attention. <laughs> What I'm doing is I'm taking notes, as you all discuss, um, so that we can have these notes uh, for, for our later uh, conversations. Um, I think that covers everything, all of the instructions that I wanted to give us. So um, anyone who would like to start can, um, can get us started off. Go ahead and jump in as you're ready. 
Should we start by defining languaging, guys? I thought this writer was incredibly beautiful. Yeah. Very talented writer, and there's so many wonderful definitions of languaging. Maybe we should just, in rapid fire, sort of spit some of those out. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, languaging might be defined as expressing your home habitus. Anyone got another one? It makes me think I, about just flexible communication. Wait, say that again. Who was that? Flexible communication. I, I saw it as also just the doing, uh, implying what we do with language, that it's very active and constantly changing. And that I we agree. Uh, I thought it was, uh, uh, to me, it felt very much like performing. Yeah. Um, I don't have the text in front of me. However, I think languaging is just really the ability to speak or communicate and it's not literacy because you could be languaging and uh, able to do everything as far as a dialogue, but not be able to read or write. And in this context, I don't have it in front of me, but I was listening to Gary. And I think that this writer was saying that often languaging can also reflect your um, cultural or ethnic background or even your socioeconomic um, status, so it's very different from literacy. I also thought, well, I'll just read what I wrote, but which is a lot of what people said, that it's using language, speaking, but making choices about words, expressions, idioms, depending on what you want your hearers to understand. So it's the performative use of all the different language codes that you might have available to you, whether that's a lot or a few, but it's it's also making all of these unconscious choices or maybe conscious choices, but making all kinds of micro choices about, about how you're presenting your linguistic capacities. And yes, I agree. I, I also said that it seemed to require a lot of metalinguistic um, abilities, trying to really um, think about how to best make meaning with particular audiences and you know, conversational it partners. Like it's up to the speaker, right? It's not, the speaker's not held to any standard external from the speaker. Um, the word performance has been used twice. Can we, I'm curious if the, uh, is, was it, is it Tisha? Tisha, is that how you say yes. Tisha and Jennifer? Can you guys talk a little bit more about what you mean by performance in the context of this, of defining languaging? Well, the, the reason I, I thought of performance is that he states very clearly that um, he wanted to perform as white. And that, and that was not something that was natural to him. It's something that he had to acquire and then uh, and express. But I'm an art historian, so I don't know much about this stuff. So. But languaging is to create, is to take a noun, right, language, and turn it into a verb, which we haven't seen, so that's why we're sort of struggling maybe a little bit with this. I didn't necessarily think that when a student was languaging that there was necessarily the element of choice to perform, but, but now I can see that perhaps that's true. I was thinking of languaging as using the language of your upbringing, using the right. language of my nurture, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, using your, you know, your intersectional, he also said intersectional, racialized, educational, and linguistic history. So I thought languaging was necessarily speaking from, again, your home habitus, but what I'm hearing other people say is you can perform, in, you can language in different ways in different contexts. Yeah, I also, um, similar, well, I also thought that there was part of um, self-definition going on with selecting the type of language being used um, as he was talking about the code meshing that he's doing, even in the writing, how he's kind of selectively choosing from his home habitus and also um, from the more mainstream white middle class ways of speaking. It also seems to me that it included nonverbal expression, right? right? He just talks about movement. Yeah, so uh, I mean, the, what I jotted down was use of idioms, phrases, tones, mannerisms to convey meaning. And I think the conveying meaning uh, and, and, and being part of an interaction is an important part of it. I mean, you can approach uh, literary analysis without having any kind of, of, you know, interaction that you're trying to foster. But I think when you're languaging, you're talking, you're, you're using all the things that, 
that are, are, are native to you to, to interact a, a with the person you're languaging with and to get across the meanings that you want to get across. But that brings back into it, you're using the idioms that are native to you. So languaging is a, a term, again, we don't typically see, I think because there's that political element of this being a kind of speech, a kind of discourse that comes from your home. I, I at least I would disagree that it, that the way now is using languaging always is the sort of language of nurture right. i think i think he really is talking about the fact that we can language in lots of different ways or some of us can mm -hmm. um and any of those is languaging but there's a home languaging or an that that may be different from literacy right which may be which comes to sort of the next question which may be different from mastery of standard white uh mm -hmm. english american english um and it, and and of course, of course, you're at least you're pointing to what's what's so um, productive about the concept of languaging is because it validates that other thing and and makes it an an important source of right. ideas and That's information. But yeah. um, I do think yeah. it's, it's it felt it, it it appeared to me upon reading it that um, in some ways it, in my brain I can we'll organize it in terms of what languaging is not, which is that it's not. Um, necessarily the, the assumed formalized standard that's taught in an educational, traditional educational system, um, which again, I think refers back to uh, nurture, right? Or what I would think of as personal history outside of a formalized education or pre-formalized education. But I think what's additionally interesting is how he, wraps in the the combination of those two histories um in and then that's where the element of choice comes in right and so the confrontation between himself and a student um makes that compelling because he can see both himself prior to the education and his current state in the education system and so i think it also gives ren us a tool oh sorry i was just gonna say ren is asking a question ren's in the outer circle but it seems to want to ask a question so i i don't know what the protocol is for that I don't know. May I? May I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. I wonder what's the difference between languaging and vernacular? What's the difference between? Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good question and maybe a good moment for us to switch to, to the outer circle so the outer circle can uh, come in. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. So, so we're, we're switching over to our outer circle. Outer circle is going to come in and we have this good question from Ren about languaging and, and vernacular and, and literacy and vernacular, languaging and vernacular. Um, and, and maybe you want to comment on that or any of the other ideas that have come up so far. So those of you moving to the inner circle, go ahead and unmute your mics. And those of you who are moving to the outer, go ahead and mute your mics. And that'll give us kind of a visual cue of, of who's, who's where. Um, and uh, um, and go ahead and jump in. What do we think? Oh, I'm sorry for breaking the rule. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, languaging and vernacular, or lang it's, it's hard sometimes mm. to pick pick up. So, languaging and vernacular, or or if you want to just address the the, the first question. Um, with maybe something you saw different. We've talked about performance and performativity. We've talked about nurture and choice. Um, and we also have this question about, um, uh, you know, what is the relationship between languaging and vernacular? Are these the same things? Are they just related things? So, so any of these are good to pick up on. I think um, one thing I, I took out of it was languaging in this context, the the term that comes to mind is power. It's kind of informal power. So there can be multiple languagings. So his students languaging, the languaging of his youth, the languaging of the academy, which often tries to dominate those other forms of languaging. So it seems to be there's a, in languaging, there's a lot of informal power, whereas in literacy, it, there seems to be much more of a kind of dominant form of power. So I would just be curious about the way in which power plays into 
these different forms, whether it's languaging or um, literacy. If I can jump in just quickly to say that one of the things that I think you're, point, you're pointing to, Matthew, is the ability for languaging to be plural, whereas literacy is a kind of assumed to be a single universal standard. And so maybe one of the ways in which we locate the relations and operations of power is the way in which various forms of languaging or performances of languaging are held to uh, a single standard of literacy, right? Uh, uh, and I think, you know, to further com complicate the issue, it's that, you know, even if there weren't uh, that comparison being made, which I think we're being invited to consider, languaging itself is plural. And so there's always the risk in languaging of misinterpretation and misunderstanding or uh, uh, the need for, for further mediation um, uh, uh, because of the particularity of uh, where of, of someone's upbringing or the, the various ways in which one is influenced in how they communicate. Uh, so I, I would just offer those two points that languaging is plural and that, you know, uh, literacy may not be and that there's a potential for a power relation there, but um, one that already is co complicates a, the given plurality of languaging. Uh, I jump in here, jump back in, even though I'm in the other group. Well, we want to try and reserve the space for those who are okay. now in the inner circle, so they have they have a chance. Um, okay. But we can flip back one more time at the end and give the those of you uh, one more chance to to jump in. So, I guess getting back to Ren's question, I think vernacular is sort of a part of languaging because it's about the vocabulary, the grammatical sentence structure, the syntax. And for me, languaging was sort of broader because it did also encompass the nonverbal, what you guys were calling performative aspect before, um, and also the type of even points that might be brought up um, or the discourse that's chosen. So like in cross-cultural psych, the sort of American Western ideal is whenever you make a point, it needs to be logic based, right? And that's like the formal way of presenting evidence and having it be trusted or viewed as correct. And that's not true across all cultures that might value other forms of evidence like anecdotal data more. Um, and so for me, that's sort of the difference. The vernacular is part of the languaging, but the languaging was encompassing everything, like what you choose to talk about, what you highlight as evidence or trust more, and even the body language and stuff like that too. I, I get the impression that languaging has a geopolitical component to it. For example, um, there are differences among the Spanish speaking countries in terms of uh, vocabulary and usage. Um, that is the uh, Spanish spoken in Spain is perhaps different in significant ways from the Spanish spoken in South America. Um, so I think this goes beyond just um, what goes on here in America. Um, as another historical example, I'm just thinking about um, Yiddish as a form of languaging vis-a-vis -vis German. Uh, and again, that, that to me points to a geopolitical component of languaging. I was really taken by the way that, um, I'm sorry that my camera is off, um, but I was really taken with the way that Inoue describes how language moves in and out of groups, which I think speaks to this point about, um, about geographical and well, not just geographical, but you know, regional spaces and how that um, forms different uh, variations of what the author calls code meshing, right? So that we do code meshing in different ways. And that I think to me, was just really important to have um, pointed out and to kind of think about the ways in which language uh, is contingent and contextually developed as a part of that kind of process of racialization um, that as others have mentioned, right, um, um, 
uh, depending on which type of analysis you're doing, the tail end or the or the consequence of of power relationships. Um, but when I thought about literacy, um, I thought immediately about how literacy for this author is tied to acquisition, um, possessing uh, property of not wanting to be poor, right? and so the kind of way in which we understand literacy is immediately tied to um, is tied to class and is tied to that kind of you know the relationship of of the class mobility and the relationship between what one can acquire to move into a new space um, as designated by the status quo. So I thought that was really interesting. So let's go ahead uh, uh, and um, flip, give a chance to flip right back one more time. Those of you who are now in the outer circle, go ahead and move to the inner. And if you have um, any last thoughts to, to bring in um, at this time, um, uh, and I guess we could invite anyone, you know, outer or inner circle, we're, we're a small enough group. Any, any last thoughts uh, that have come up in these? Um, well, we didn't answer your last question. All right, well, let's answer it. I don't think. I mean, Any thoughts on how languaging, um, how attention to languaging might provide ways out of the problems of literacy? And I think Mariel was sort of touching on, uh, on some ideas there. And this can come from either inner or outer. Yes, Mariel, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, I just line from um, that section on page nine. White people whiteness as ratio linguistic dispositions and habits or habits are the context and contingency for effectiveness or goodness or appropriateness or and that's one way that you're um, hang on Mariel you're breaking up a little bit I don't know is she breaking up for others yeah, I can't, I can't yeah? Hear you. okay um, you uh, could you try on. reading that again I, I can put the quote in the chat so that it doesn't break up while I'm reading it but you yeah great you're clear now <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was just, I was simply reading this quote on, on um, the bottom of page nine um, that was expressing, it seems to me, um, in U.S. concept of, of talking about the ratio linguistic habitus that, um, that we ought to recognize and, and also to think about how that, um, how that shapes uh, this kind of, uh, or a set of standards that, um, are good, appropriate, excellent, right? The kind of mastery um, that Jenny was talking about earlier. Um, that seems to be one of the ways to, to get out of the dilemma or to address, I, I don't, I don't want to say get out, but to address the dilemma rather. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, just, which really just echoes what Marielle just said, but that if, if literacy is a standard, which some people meet more than others, or some some languagings meet and some don't meet. Um, languaging is something that everybody does. There's no question that everybody languages, and so it's it is not um, it, it's not saying some people are better at it than others. Everybody does it, and everybody does it well because it's not a thing that you do well or badly. It's a thing you do, however you do it, and however and however in many ways you do it. I like that way of thinking about it. It makes me think also about languaging as being this dynamic, active, you know, um, always changing process, whereas literacy is more like a fixed state. And when he talks about choices in the end, it, it puts the focus back on how we go about, you know, writing or how we go about grading or solving a problem on the challenge, as opposed to like, it's this or it's that. And so I think it keeps, it keeps the, the learning dynamic. 
and more active for me. It also seemed to me that no matter how one tried, unless you started out white, having literacy as a noun, as a possession, even if you figure out how to play the game, you never internalize it. And I think he spoke so much about his mother working so hard, so hard. And while she would claim she was white, he thought she never believed it inside. And I had the impression that that was also true when it, just one, one way of communicating is deemed the one way. Even if you can play the game, you never feel it's not, it's not comfortable. You're always being judged by a standard, like he said, you know, even just be, you're never going to be the smartest guy in the in the room, no matter what you do, no matter how you communicate. So I thought that was it makes it really difficult. It's, yeah, I would be curious, just thinking about um, this entire exercise as an exercise in languaging, and as a dominant form of communication. Thinking about my students and our students and how often they feel um, in class, well, in my experience, in classrooms that they're always looking for the right words or the right answer. Mm -hmm. And just curious about how this format is also playing into a particular type of languaging that is actually enforcing the very thing that we're talking about. So it, and I find it deeply problematic because, you know, basically the patterns that I always see in the classroom is a small group of people have mastered the art of speaking up, and then the, the vast silent majority, no matter, even if I point this out, sit there and often grumble, or just let the other people do the labor for them, which is part of figuring out the system, right? This whole, this whole literacy of the classroom. So I'd be curious, and maybe this is not for this conversation right now, how we're gonna disrupt that in this format. Um, yeah, let me pause you right there, just in the interest of time. I think that's a great question um, and, and something to always be thinking about as, as we're implementing this. Um, because yes, in, even in a format like this or when we're live, um, we can end up with um, a privileging of a certain set of voices and we want to think about ways to, to dis disrupt that. Um, and so, um, I mean, I don't want to get in, I, I, I won't get into that entirely, but there are certain kinds of supports that um, we use in, th that I use in this kind of shared inquiry process that try and help alleviate some of the pressures that students might feel um, about joining the conversation, about um, uh, getting uh, their ideas together. So. Um, having the opportunity to reread the text together. For example, when I read it aloud, for students who have never heard um, or aren't, um, um, there, there, there might be words in there that they've only ever seen in print, right? Um, I, I, some of you may have experienced this in your life where you uh, encounter academic words, but you've only ever seen them in print, and you kind of guess what it sounds like, but you don't know what it sounds like. Um, and so reading aloud helps um, with uh, um, those sorts, sorts of issues that might come up, but it also um, makes sure that we're all, all of our attention is on a focused place um, uh, when we get started. The other thing I do is um, uh, with the templates, and I'm going to return us to the templates now. By the way, um, I want to, well, uh, all of the, the discussion that we've had, students will get there. You got there a lot faster uh, than, than they do, um, but they will have some very deep conversations. And if you have the right supports in, you will get um, uh, participation from many different voices. Um, but it, it's, it's always figuring out the ways to support that. Um, so uh, I want to um, show you what I would return to now um, so, so the template. The template is another thing that supports students who may not um, be coming from a, a background that, that supports, uh, you know, languaging in uh, the, the academic sort of way. Um, and so the template, um, there we go, we should be able to see it now. 
the, the template helps guide how uh, these kinds of arguments are, uh, are can be set up. Um, and students, as they get more comfortable, can go off the template, and they do, uh, but the template really helps them um, to, to start getting these ideas on paper, especially if they're very hesitant or afraid uh, to do so. The other thing I want to add is that one of the things that I'm implementing uh, this semester in my classes is contract. I am starting to use contract grading uh, following some of uh, NYS recommendations, and that's another way that I want to um, reshape the classroom in ways that are going to, um, uh, uh, in, instead of trying to be fair, in ways that are not unfair, right, as anyway says. Um, uh, so uh, um, what I would have you do right now in a uh, regular classroom discussion is I would um, uh, present to you um, this second template, which is a follow-up and reflection. And at this point, students are asked to, and they would do this just in writing on the same piece of paper where they wrote the first part, um, to identify someone in the discussion who offered a perspective that changed their thinking in some way. So during the discussion, let's say Jennifer offered the perspective that, and then they can reflect back what they heard in the discussion from Jennifer. Um, and then they can go uh, on and say, this affected by my thinking by, and they talk about how their thinking may have changed um, in, in small or very radical ways. It's, you know, it's totally um, however it changed. Um, and they get better at this second part, the follow-up and reflection as time uh, goes on. But I do require that they submit these so that I can see how their thinking is developing. So I'm having them write it by hand, partly because I want to avoid the some of the, the the, the easy possibility of Googling, right? Uh, what is languaging? Um, if they're writing by hand, they're really focused. And also I think there's something tactile about it that, that helps uh, with the thinking process. Um, so once they're done with this, I'm not going to have you do this today just because we're, we're, uh, we don't have enough time for it, but it's a really good um, uh, follow-up process. Do you, do you have them take a photo of their, their their handwriting and then they upload that to Moodle or they email it to you? Okay. Upload it. Yeah. So they're just going to take out their phone, take a photo of the paper. This is great because they have the assignment to look back at later too, right? And I do. They can make sure it's visible. Um, make sure that they can use all the photo editing. They're very good at that. They do Instagram, you know. Um, and make sure that um, it's their assignment is legible, and then they're just going to upload it. This is a, uh, what the assignment looks like on uh, the Moodle page. Um, it's just a very basic Moodle assignment. Um, and uh, what I've put in there is instructions on how to take the photo, make sure it's clear, use the editing features if necessary. It's a little hard to see there. Um, uh, and um, and then they're just going to upload it. Moodle accepts image files, so um, and they can do it right from their phone. They can access Moodle from their phone and upload it that way. So I want to also say that when I get to this last part, the follow-up and reflection, I make sure that there's still 15 minutes or so left in class. I want them to write this final part while they're still sitting there in front of the camera. Um, uh, because. I, I want them it all fresh. The moment they close the window, they start thinking about other things and they forget that fresh, lively discussion that they just had. So I want them to reflect while it's still there. So you wanna make sure you finish class 15 minutes early, um, let them finish this. And then I'm thinking that I'm going to give them um, a, a certain amount of time. I'm thinking about 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes after class to submit it on Moodle or an hour, I'm gonna see how it goes um, with that, with the timing. But I, what I have found is the, if, if, they, have, if they have 24 hours, they, they forget what the discussion was. So this is just, I'm trying to recreate the in-class um, feel here, so that they're submitting right away. Um, so they'll do those and upload uh, before they leave. Um, okay. Can I ask a question about that? Yes, please. Just um, have you ever had them share 
some of their reflections? I have not. Um, what, uh, although we, you certainly could. So another option I thought of um, to do this would be, you could do it as a forum, right? right? So instead of an assignment, you could just make it a forum. If you did it as a forum, then they'd all be able to see each other's responses. Right. Um, I think I would ask my class how they feel about that because for some students who are um, who, who struggle more with writing, allowing this to be something that's a draft that they can develop is more helpful than than making it public published. Right. Um, what I do do um let me uh see if i can bring us back to so if you go back to come on oh, whoops okay there we go if we go back to the google drive um what you will see now it's now the last file item in the google drive um, is there's a file called discussion notes. <clears throat> and those are the notes that I was taking as you all were talking. Um, and it creates this, it, it's, it's very, you know, it's rough. I'm typing without looking. There's often typos, excuse all of those. But I take that and then I post that to that Google link to our classroom. And, and it's, um, I allow them the ability to comment. And what students can do is now they can go back to that, that Google document and they can fill in um, uh, with, you know, some, I've had students post memes that relate to what we're, we were talking about. They can just post comments and say, oh, I heard this, it made me think of this. So they can revisit that as much as they like and, and keep that document live. And I just do the same document all semester just um, adding, 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 um, so they can go right back to that. It also makes a good review art um, uh, document for them. Yeah. Yeah, so lots of ways you can, you can do this. Um, okay, so, so some of the basics here, um, whether we're doing high tech or low tech, the fundamentals you wanna do, you, they need to read. Um, in my actual classes, I have a re some kind of reading check to make sure that they read. Um, uh, this semester, they're going to have to do a little assignment where they write questions based on the text and submit those before class. And that, that's how I'm going to check. Um, you want them to read before class and then you want to reread in class. And it, I, I like to read it aloud for them. They say it's helpful to hear it. Um, sometimes it's awkward over Zoom, but um, yeah. And then you want them to reflect. So read, reread, and reflect. These are very important. Having that template and giving them the time to stop and think and write their thoughts down before they enter the conversation is super important. Um, not everybody thinks on the fly. Not everybody sees the question and is right out the door. Um, so they need to have that time to reflect and write their thoughts down. Um, and uh, um, I give, you know, again, I watch the faces and see when it looks like most people are ready to move, we, we start to move forward. Um, questioning, listening, and responding. Yes, Jennifer, I see you. Okay, lots of questions. Do you ever have them read instead of you in class? Or, or if you don't, is there a reason that you don't? Like, for, I, use it, I use that sometimes, I, I often say like, especially if you're someone who doesn't speak easily, like this is your chance to hear mm -hmm. your voice in class. You know, does anyone want to volunteer to read? And um, do you? I don't, I don't put the, I, I, I never put the invite out there, but if a student says to me, can I do it? I do. Um, uh, and I, I would be okay saying in a class, I'm gonna read this aloud. If you ever want to be the person who reads it aloud, let me know. Um, you know, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I want, I, I don't generally um, put it out there. Now, yeah. um, so questioning, listening, responding, listening is super important. Reinforce that as much as possible. There's still going to be some points where students go, uh, my mind wandered. 
or like there was that moment when we switched from inside to outside when we were sort of like okay how do we train of thought derailed news at 11 you know um and and the reason so that's one of the reasons that taking the notes is super helpful um because i can just look back at the notes i've taken and said we talked about this and we talked about this and this came up you know we can start with any of these threads what do you want to pick up um, I will say that as the facilitator, the one, one thing that I have found that you absolutely don't want to do is put your opinion in there or even say you have an opinion. Because there's no faster way to stop a class of students from taking the risk, right, of commenting on very complex topics than to say, you you have an idea because then they they're like wait what's the answer i have to guess what what is he thinking uh, you know so i just let it be totally them and they they get to some very complex and very intelligent places um just by letting them do that um and then also same text same question same context super important um uh, uh you you want to make sure we're you know literally and figuratively all on the same page. I just had a silly question, I, and you you said it earlier, and I just think I missed it. When you're typing out those notes, Carrie, are you in a different? Are, are you on? Are you on a different computer? I just was trying to think of logistically how you do that. Sorry, I know that seems yeah. really silly, but no, it's logistically important. It's an important question. Um, I am. I have two two computers okay. um, set up. I have a laptop and I have a desktop. You can also do two screens, yep. so you can have. Uh, one screen with Zoom and one screen with uh, your document. Um, so that way you're typing your document and you're still scanning their faces. Okay, I just I just went ahead and visualize that for myself. Thanks. Yeah, if you're really in a pinch, the other thing you can do is you can use your phone to Zoom and do the document over here. Um, the downside of that is you don't get the big gallery view on your phone. Flip side, you could use your computer and you could handwrite your notes. If you're very strong and fast at writing, you could handwrite notes and then again take a photo and post them. Yeah. Um, so so lots of options for for how to get that set up. Okay. What texts are good for this? Yes. Oh oh, I see a hand. Uh, Mariel. Mar Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to to um, actually thank you for for saying what not to do because you see that so often when that when once students hear that you have a, a sense of an opinion, especially if it's posed in any kind of a binary situation, it becomes impossible for them to focus on something outside of whatever it would be a regurgitation and the the idea that. Um, the idea of leaving your voice out of it, I think is so important because I think it speaks back to Matthew's question. Because once they start to hear your voice, um, especially because we, all of us, I think in so many different ways have, have adopted the, a certain kind of literacy of the academy, um, they start feeling um, very conscious about how your voice sounds so different from their own. Even the way, that, you know, there's a, there's that great line in in um, in Americana um, where she's making fun of the way academics speak, the ways in which, right, that we mm -hmm. use all the time. So I I really just I wanted to say thank you for saying that because it's so easy to forget. Um, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm glad you uh, uh, shared that and reinforced that, and I love that book. So I'm glad you referenced it. Um, and uh, um, yeah, trust the students. They, they come up with just, their thoughts are, are brilliant. They're paying attention to the world. They come up with really um, complex ideas and they, they build off of each other's in, in amazing ways. Um, so yeah, the hard, one of the hard parts there is, is taking yourself out of the conversation. Okay, so what texts are good for this? Um, uh, and, and I am a comparative literature scholar, so I use the term text broadly here. Um, uh, we can mean a lot of different types of texts, uh, um, but 
uh, text, uh, so we can talk about visual texts as well, or dramatic texts, or performance texts, you know, I'm open. Um, but you want uh, texts that present complex issues and suggest an interesting interpretive questions. Um, uh, something especially that leaves you, even with all of the scholarship you've done in your life, um, you know, and you're, you're um, we're all really strong readers and, and have strong opinions about what we read when we read it, but even you still have genuine and interesting unanswered questions when you walk away from a text. So those make the best ones. And I can tell you that if you have a question, if the question that you develop to lead the discussion is one that you don't have an answer to, those are the best conversations the students will have. Just hands down, um, you'll love them uh, and, and love seeing them develop. So, so look for the things that you're still, start from your own sense of wonder and questioning as well. Um, which is, again, another way to, to, to give some of that power instruct over to the students, right? To not hold on to the power of being the knowing person in the room. Um, you don't have to be that person in this format. You can be just somebody who's wondering, you know, and, and throwing this, this question out for, for the students to work with. Um, multimedia texts are great. Um, you need some modifications to the second read process. Um, that might be, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a visual arts scholar, but it might be something like, let's look back at this, uh, let's look back at this painting. I want you to consider things that look like this, or I want you to consider colors that evoke this, or, you know, and you kind of guide them to what they're looking for, potentially. Um, you know, there's ways you could, you could play with that. Film, um, it takes a little doing, but you can play back clips of film via Zoom but you just have to make sure when you do the screen share that you select the option to share your computer's audio as well. And you need a good, strong bo uh, broadband uh, you know, connection to do it. Uh, and, and just, be, just be aware that Zoom does have a wall so that you cannot, for example, show an Amazon video. Um, mm. There are all sorts of copyright laws that you could use, you can use v YouTube, but yeah. you really have to be careful and test it in advance through Zoom because I have tried to show a video through Amazon. <laughs> Didn't work. Yeah, good, good, absolutely good point. Yeah, so you just have to work those things around, but you still want the second read, right? You want them to look at it outside of class, you want them to look at it inside of class. And when they look at it inside of class, you want it to be a little more focused and you want to tell them what they're, tell them what kinds of things they're looking for. Not what are they looking for, but what kinds of things, right? Um, if that makes sense. <laughs> so you don't want to tell them the question in advance. You want them to kind of just something related. It's hard to explain. Um, and um, it, it can be a print book. It can be a scanned book. It can be an ebook. It doesn't matter in 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 that sense if you're using a a, a book or or a, a, a traditional text. Um, any of these you can work with. You just have to give very clear instructions um, and and keep in mind that you might have to give a page number and also um, search for this uh, uh, keyword search to to get to the point you need. Okay, what makes a good question? It has to be interpretive. Um, factual questions uh, don't, don't work really well. Um, uh, and evaluative questions uh, don't work really well. Although uh, an evaluative question um, is, might be something that's really good to do as a follow-up assignment for an, a full-length essay or a discussion board or something that you do next, right? So you move up the Bloom's taxonomy um, as you go. So this really, you want to really focus on um, meaning making at this level of discussion. Um, yeah. Um, sometimes I've done it where I start with interpretive and I sort of end with, um, do you think this will work? You know, I give them a little tail end evaluative and I found that works okay, but you, you, you still have to work your way up to it um, in, within that one discussion question. Um, shallow binaries don't work, you know, <laughs> do you agree or disagree? Um, unless, I, I mean, generally, if it's very simple, it doesn't work. Um, should questions, um, 
po especially politics beyond the text, I have not had much luck with um, because it tends to invite students to really pull too much on their own biases um, or their own, um, they've already have an opinion and they draw on that more than on the text, right? Um, if you do, um, so yeah, so um, we wanna avoid those. Uh, the question should be based on, on gaps in the narrative or argument or contradictions and especially ones that you're still wondering about. Like, why did that? Why was that? Mm. What was that about, right? Um, the question needs to be very specific to the text at hand. Um, if the, uh, if the same question could be asked of another text, it's not a good question, right? Um, it needs to be specific to this. Uh, you wanna, um, this is again with the, sh relates to that should, avoid questions that encourage students, students to lean on their own biases too much, um, uh, because then what you end up is having students just discussing their own bias. They're always going to be there, right? But um, you wanna, they, that's what they get hooked on. Um, and this should go without saying, but um, group identity or rights shouldn't be um, a part of the question as like a should question or what, right? Like group identities exist. Um, people have rights. These are not up for discussion uh, ever. Um, and so you want to avoid questions that try and especially um, uh, 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 put make those the focus. I mean, with Inway's work, it would have been very easy for me uh, to set up a question that um, put his identity at the center of the discussion. But his identity is not for us to discuss, right? And so, so we don't want to make those that that part of a discussion. Um, I've had very excellent discussion on discussions on texts about transgender rights. Um, and transgender representation. So you can discuss groups, but the, the question cannot be about identity. And in the Google Drive, there's some examples too. Um, okay, so now let's, let's get into some of the, the tech and the setup, uh, the, the nitty gritty questions that I'm sure you have. Um, so what do we wanna do uh, before the class? Uh, you wanna read the text yourself. It's probably one you're already familiar with, but read it again. Um, it's always good to do that. Um, and read it this time looking for a section that left you with a genuine interpretive question. Something that left you with an unanswered question. You wanna know, you wanna think more about this. Um, that's the best place to start. So once you have that, and the question is the hardest part for me every time, I can't tell you, how long it took me to set up the question for this because I kept overthinking it um, and thinking you all would be, you know, this is too easy a question, but no. Um, uh, um, but just start with that genuine interpretive question and then from there create uh, that handout. Um, there are some examples in the, um, the Google Drive. I just take the one, I just take an old one and update it for the new question. I, change the template up a little bit to emphasize different sorts of things. Um, and then you wanna create the assignment link or discussion board for students um, to submit to after the discussion. So just have those things set up. Um, and then comes the part where we need to mess around with Zoom um, and change the settings um, and, and, and get familiar with some stuff. Um, so, we're going to set and check our Zoom settings. And you can do this as students are logging in. Um, but I did find out that, I did figure out that you can, what you can also do is um, you can open any Zoom session, um, like your office hours session, and you can mess with the settings there and then it saves for, for all of your meetings, apparently. So, what you wanna do is you are gonna go into your Zoom setting and the most important thing is to set your gallery view so that you can see up to 49 students at a time. And then you're gonna set your shortcuts. So um, I'm gonna show you what this looks like. And because Zoom doesn't like to show you my Zoom screen, I just had to screenshot stuff. So um, 
what you're going to look for, it's not intuitive at all. You're going to look for this icon up there in the, the green one, up there in the top left corner, right? Um, I, it's so not intuitive that I found it once and then went away and came back and lost it because I couldn't remember which one it was. Um, the one that looks like a little security badge is the one you're going to click. And when you click on that, it's going to open um, a pop-up window like this that has some very important settings and some less important settings. And you wanna set these in advance um, uh, and I would just set them, I'm just setting them for all my classes so they're ready to go. Um, and they'll save on this device, they'll stay the same time and time again. So under general, there's a number of things you can set up here, um, like if you're using dual monitors, you can set up the dual monitors um, right uh, in the, right there, oops, sorry, right there, missed it. Um, but uh, um, the other things you want to set are um, the automatically uh, um, copy the invite le link once the meeting starts. Um, because what that'll do is that if you get an email from a student who says they're having trouble logging in, you can quickly paste the invite link to an email and send it to them. And that happened in this session right so um so you want to make sure it's doing that um and then these other things you can set as you you know feel feel you want to set or don't want to set um, but that is is important there the other thing you want to set so next you want to click on video and then there, this is, if you scroll down in this uh, section here, it's down at the bottom, the, um, there's a little uh, um, option that says display up to 49 participants per screen in gallery view. And you wanna set that. Um, and then you can set uh, these things, these other things if, or, or not, you know, you can touch up your appearance um, just in case you're worried about about that, I was obviously, um, and, but but the 49, uh, 49 participants is important because when you're on your device screen and you switch to gallery view, you're now hopefully nobody has more than forty nine students in a class here, right? In a in a um, in a in an online class, that's that would be crazy, um, in my humble opinion. But so you should be able to see your whole class on the screen as long as you have under 49 students. Yes, Jennifer. I was trying to do it and uh, my computer tells me that my CPU only supports up to 25 students. Yeah, okay. me too. We, me we too. need to request me better tech. tech. Who do we write the letter to? Okay. <laughs> And, okay. and Keith Landis that, said yeah. it, that's true for him as well. Yeah, Keith's ah, really? true. You're, you're, they're limiting, huh? Okay, well, you'll get up to 25. Yeah. You'll get a, big, a big view. Um, wow. Up Maybe I big. can do it at home. I'm glad to know. I'm, at the, I'm actually at the office right now, so. Okay, so try, uh, on, try on, if you have another device to try on. Try I'll on try another it, device. But thanks, yeah, okay. Yeah, Thank if you. you have a very large class section, like 60 or 70 students, um, or 120 E, um, you should I'm, you should look into some options for um, um, getting students to co-host. Um, and so, if they do, if you if you're you should. It should not be unpaid labor or un, un, um, credited. Un, yeah, uncredited labor, right? So um, there are a lot of ways to build that in, but uh, if, you have, if you have that many students and not a TA, um, you, you, because it's very hard to see students for a discussion um, when you have that many, right? Um, yeah. Do you, do you ever use the breakout room function in relationship to this? Yeah. Um, 
talk about for, for this i have not when i do team-based learning classes which is really team-based learning is really more designed for the large sections right um, and team-based learning allows you to put the initial stage of discussion into a smaller group and then bring the smaller groups back to the bigger group. In that way, I have, if that makes sense. Yeah, but you, there, there's a way to do it, but you'd, I think you'd have to sort of mesh shared inquiry with team-based learning to really find a way to do that. What did you mean about co-hosting and like what would the advantage of that be? Yeah, so the way I'm handling things like that in my classroom is I am, I said I'm using contract grading this semester. And so um, contract grading, one of the ways that they, um, the, the baseline grade is a B, and one of the ways to get a higher grade is to perform additional credited tasks like projects or um, one of the options I have for them is they can facilitate a shared inquiry um, to, to get that to boost to get that boost, um, and co-hosting could be another one. So if they were co-hosting, what they could do is they could monitor the participants and say, excuse me, so-and-so has a question, or we have a question in the chat we need addressed, right? So they can be someone who helps you um, keep an eye on all the screens plus the chat. Yeah. Good question. Um, so, um, so another setting that we want to, and there's, there's multiple settings here we want to do. Another setting we want is going to be keyboard shortcuts. And when you set your keyboard shortcuts, it's, I mean, the same menu we've been in. You want to select this over here that says enable global shortcut. And the idea there, it's, I won't say it works 100% of the time, but about, yeah, let's say 80% of the time it works. Um, global, if you enable the global shortcut, that means that if you are here presenting in, um, a sh you're sharing your screen, but you need to do something with um, Zoom, you can use the shortcut and it'll still um, make, uh, it'll still perform the task. So let me get more specific. So if I want to open my, um, my chat box, the shortcut for chat box is Alt-H on a PC. Um, if the global shortcut is enabled, that means even if, I'm, even if my Zoom window is not on top in my display, I can still use the shortcut and it'll pop the chat up. Um, and it gives me trouble sometimes, but, um, but generally it works. So you want um, several of the things here selected, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to show you a list here in just a moment that'll be easier to see. You wanna um, select enable shortcuts. Okay, so here are the things you wanna enable. This is easier to see. So for each of these, you want to check that blue box. And then these are the things you want to practice using. Um, you know, have a, um, a, a happy hour with friends so you can practice using them or something. But practice using them because um, it, it'll make, th these are your friends. It's going to make things easier. Um, so this first one is going to bring your Zoom meeting to the top, no matter where it is so if you're off in another window and you're like i need to go back to that um if you do and um i also have this chart for mac in the google document okay um so um so this first one will will bring the zoom meeting controls to the top so um if you're in another window um control alt shift pops those up to the top so you can see your zoom controls um, if you don't have that big gallery view of 49, you can scroll quickly through page up, page down, through your participants. Um, and in Mac, the, the command for sw switching between speaker and gallery is the same, but in Windows, it's two different ones. So Alt F1, Alt F2 will switch between speaker view and gallery view. Um, this is a really important one. Um, mute all. 
right? Alt-M will mute everybody except the host. So if you're talking and there's something happening in the background, you can just click that really quickly and, um, and that'll allow your voice to come through. Um, if you're sharing your screen, oh, this is, I need to correct this because I found out that this is not right. It's just Alt-S. So if, you, if you're sharing your screen and you want to stop sharing your screen, it's Alt-S. If you want to start sharing your screen, it's Alt-S, right? So you can go back and forth. You can also just pause your screen sharing by using Alt-T and then go back to it with the same. Um, chat is Alt-H, participants is Alt-U, and then um, your floating meeting controls um, is what is it? Control, Alt, Shift, H. I don't use that very often. But. Okay, so those are your really important shortcuts. If you are, um, uh, if you're on a, on a Mac, you want to go to the Google Documents, and there's a document. It is uh, Document 3, Zoom Tips for Sharing, um, and that has the Mac shortcuts on it. Um, <clears throat> So many things. There are notes on all of these, so, so, um, and they're all in the Google Drive, so we can look back at them and I can answer questions at any point. Um, so what do you wanna do uh, when you, uh, in, in terms of what do you do in the class? You wanna assign the text as homework. I just have them on my syllabus. Um, you wanna remind students of the guidelines for shared inquiry. I do it at the beginning of every session, just so they're, it's fresh in their minds. Draw their attention to a relevant portion of the text, um, and then mute everyone while you're reading it to them. Um, so read aloud, ask them to look for something in particular that's going to help them with the question. And then share the discussion question in part one, and I'm just doing it as a PowerPoint and then pasting in the chat. Um, ask them to respond using the, the question. If you're doing inside outside class circles, you can divide the class. If you have a very large class and you need to do breakout rooms, you can um, uh, work, work that uh, or kind of set that up. We'd have to think it through, but it can be done. Um, and then also very important, remind everyone that they don't need to raise their hand to join the discussion, um, but, but to pay attention. So we want them to be in gallery view as well and to pay attention to the faces of their peers, um, and also to look and see if they need to help anyone join the conversation. So you noticed when we started out, it was a little uh, awkward. There was some, you know, trying to figure out how to get into the conversation, but we worked out ways of navigating that as we went. Um, and we just have to be comfortable with and encourage our students to be comfortable with those sort of awkward um, moments that might happen as we're trying to, to get in, to make space for one another, to really have that sort of grace um, that acknowledges that the tools are a little awkward and we, we're learning ways to navigate them. Um, and when you go ahead and open the discussion and then take notes, finish with about 10 to 15 minutes left for students to complete part two. So you want to give them time to finish and submit. I'm kind of going fast now because we're getting close to four o'clock, but I also wanted to show you what this looks like in my classroom and, or looks like in terms of the schedule. So here we go. Um, this is actually the schedule I've been working on for my uh, fall class. So, um, so it's kind of a draft, but um, you can see here that one of the things I've done is I've used color coding to indicate when a class is live and when a class is going to be uh, on their own. So synchronous or asynchronous. Um, uh, they need, I, th I think more visual cues to help them with that is really important. So I'm incorporating VoiceThread, which I talked about last time, and then shared inquiry. And those are my two main modes uh, for class. So when we have live class, of course, the first couple of weeks is a lot of administrative work and getting to know the procedures. But then once we get going, um, they're really fundamentally doing a voice thread lecture on their own where they're doing asynchronous discussion or they're doing a live shared inquiry cl class. And they can see when those things are happening just by looking at the schedule. I make my schedule 
for the semester at the beginning. And then if there's any change, um, I let them know, but generally it stays exactly the same. I post it on Moodle too, so they can, um, they can see uh, what, so they can see day to day what's happening in the class. Um, but it's as simple as that. I like focusing on those two modes, uh, the voice thread or the shared inquiry and not bringing in um, a, a whole bunch of other um, tools, although there are great tools out there and um, you should use the ones that work for you, but uh, uh, th this is how I'm working these two in uh, at this point. Um, all right, so that was a whole lot of stuff. I'm gonna stop share sharing here. I'm gonna remind you all of the documents, including the PowerPoint, are in the Google Drive. Um, and let me do that one more time. I'm gonna, going to give that to you. Um, and in the Google Drive, and I see you, Paul, give me just a moment. Um, in the Google Drive, you're going to see the, um, the, the reading, you'll see the PowerPoint, um, the practice that we just did question is there. There's a document that's Zoom tips for sharing um, that has the shortcuts and procedures. Um, there's a document on how to write interpretive questions and there's examples of interpretive questions. And then there are one, two, three, four examples of shared inquiry uh, handouts that I've used. So you can see what actual, and I chose the ones that worked out well. I didn't choose the ones that didn't work out well. So you got the, 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 the prime cuts there. Um, and, uh, and then there's, uh, there are two transcripts of discussion, so you can kind of see how the flow of discussion went. So um, all of that's um, my gift to you, free to use, ask me any questions um, you have uh, now or, or you can email me later. Um, Paul, did I answer your question or do you still have it? No, uh, I really wanted to, to thank you for such an informative and, and demonstrative presentation. I also thank you for not like publicly shaming anyone for going to video because it's, or off video, because it's 500 degrees in my apartment and I have to like stick my head in the freezer. I'm wondering if you could speak to, because I haven't done Zoom, do you require your students to have video on at all? How do you, how do you negotiate that issue? Yeah, so my official policy is I want them on video. Um, however, if I have a student who, um, for whom like the virtual background won't work, um, or maybe they, they need to, you know, screen what's behind and that won't work or um, I'll work, I'm willing to work with a student who's, who, who is unable to do video or, or uncomfortable for any reason. Um, but their requirements for participation or for, for demonstrating, so my, so my um, what I'm tr trying to look for is engagement. So their demonstrations of engagement needs to be the same. So are they engaging with the discussion? Are they engaging with the, the written portion? Um, and so forth. Yeah, so uh, flexible, but officially I want them on camera. Great, thank you. Welcome. And I'm trying to emphasize too, I want to emphasize in my, when I'm giving them instructions, the importance of the video for those visual cues, right? Like, so rather than shaming saying, hey, what we want to be able to do is try and look in your face and read your face um, as best we can. It's awkward, but that's what we want to try and do. Before people start to get off, I just wanted to point everyone's attention to Aviva Taubenfeld's comment uh, in the chat. Uh, Aviva had to go to another meeting at 3.30, um, and she texted me and asked uh, me to thank you, Carrie, uh, on her behalf and to thank all of the participants. She said in the comment, this is one of the most thought-provoking and helpful conversations about pedagogy I've been part of during my 16 years at Purchase. Uh, Aviva used to be the head of college writing, so I think that is a, 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 an incredible compliment. And I think uh, uh, Paul has already agreed with Aviva's comment, and I, I will as well, and say that I think we all found this incredibly helpful. I didn't want to cut off any more questions. I just wanted to make sure before people left that um, I conveyed that for her. Thank you. I enjoy doing this. This is, this is 
one of my favorite things, teaching. <laughs> I have a question, but I think Jenny, did you have a question? Oh, I think I figured it out. Oh, okay. Thank you. Though. Thank you. My question may be too long, and I, but maybe it's just another discussion and I should call you. I mean, you, you are going to use contract grading uh, coming up this fall, and you said your baseline grade will be a B. Do you have any document that you could share? Because I would love to see, I, I'm clearly I need to read the rest of the book to sort of figure that out, but I, I'm very intrigued by this idea. And can you say anything about quickly about how you're going to do that? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so uh, the book is also, I want to say really quickly, um, again, because this is, the, the whole book is available for free. It's open source. Um, uh, so I just uh, put the link in the chat. Um, so uh, in, in a way, focuses more on labor. And I'm trying to focus more on engagement. I don't know if I'm going to um, uh, quite manage that, but goals in life. Um, and uh, Marielle is right that the, the book includes templates for how to design uh, the contract. And I'm base, I've based mine off of, uh, off of his um, and, and stole, shamelessly stolen much of the formatting, although I've changed up um, some of the requirements as well. So the, the baseline it's really hard to explain in, in, in all very uh, quickly, but yes, the baseline grade for the class is a B. So any student who does all of the requirements in the class is guaranteed a B from the start of class. Um, and then if they want above that, there are additional assignments that they can do. One of the things that's worth, that can, that can give them quite a boost is facilitating a shared inquiry with their peers. Um, and uh, um, of course, doing that is something that's going to require them to come to my office and we're gonna, I'm gonna help them plan it out together. We'll come, to my, come to my virtual office, right? We're going to talk about it. I'm, and, and so it's, it's going to require them engaging in scholarly discussion with me and thinking through the text ahead of time and doing all of those kinds of planning things that teachers have to do, which I think would be great for any of our students who are going towards an, uh, an, a teaching route. Um, so there are things like that that students can do. There's a list of them they can choose. Um, and, and of course, something like hosting a shared inquiry or facilitating a shared inquiry is, is like the biggest um, and, and the biggest in, in terms of points. Um, so I, I stumbled across this book because some of my peers in rhetoric were talking about it and I was looking for something because I felt like um, that I wanted more students to, uh, I wanted to encourage students to engage with me and the text more, and I wanted that to be the basis for, um, uh, for, for grading in the class. Um, and I really meshed with um, some of Inway's discussion of how um, uh, um, students, uh, because of the whiteness of the academy, might feel, um, especially with me um, uh, appearing or you know presenting as a white cis male, that might be um, uh, students might be resisting to resisting engaging with me um, as much as I want them to because it feels like a barrier, right? Um, so um, so I wanted to engage in contract grading, and one of the things that I wanted to emphasize in my contract was a, a revision process and also a requirement that students um, meet with me individually so that we can talk one-on-one -on -one about their ideas and, and help them develop them that way. Um, rather than you know, me commenting on a draft and then hoping that they'll read the comments and in, interpret them the way I meant them. And you know, I, I wanna have those one-on-one -on -one communications that I think are much better for building relationships and helping students to succeed in the classroom and to move to their next level, right? Um, instead of an arbitrary um, bar that we have set up, I want them to move to their next level, not just to the next level that I feel like they should be at. So yeah, I have a draft document. I'm willing to share as long as you understand that it is a draft. Um, but I'd love to hear uh, anyone's um, perspective on it as well. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Any other questions? I we're past our time, but. Thank you so much, Carrie. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Fantastic.